all of these organisms thriving by taking nutrients and in the case of corals, calcium carbonate out of the seawater and precipitating it. There are occasional wrecks, for example, this of a train, which was on board a, a boat going to the sugar plantations of Cuba. Many areas show a very wide variety of beautiful and colorful corals. The rounded forms are brain corals and the more spiky blade-like forms, finger corals and moose horn corals and stag horn corals, all within reach of the light of the surface. Only the very outside sheath of the coral is in fact living. It's there that the organic tissue of the coral polyps forms a thin skin over the hard calcium carbonate skeleton. Here in this slow motion photography, the thin skin is contracting and expanding, bringing in food particles from the water. The corals form reefs, in this case a barrier reef, off the island of Hawaii. And 10 years ago, this area was one of the most beautiful of all coral reefs, known in fact as coral gardens. But recently, the reefs have been endangered by the building of houses and the laying bare of soil, which has been carried by rainstorms into the bay where the reefs previously flourished. Each rainstorm carries many, many tons of sand and mud down to the, to the coast. The rate of erosion is very much accelerated by the laying bare of the areas where the houses are to be built. And many more tons of sand and mud have been carried down recently than in the um, previous years of the century. It's very easy to neglect the effects of the sand and mud beneath the surface. But in fact, that effect is very dramatic and devastating to the corals. The thin organic covering is able to cast off or reject a certain amount of sand and mud, but nothing like the amount which has suddenly engulfed the corals off the coast of parts of Hawaii. The constant rain of sand and mud has been simply more than the corals could handle. And now, instead of the beautiful reefs of 15 years ago, the site is a much more ghastly one. Fragments of coral, such as this, like those you've just seen in the film, go to make a limestone that looks rather like this. This is a, a brain coral a large, round coral, now cut through. So limestones can be composed of coral fragments and also shell fragments, all of them calcium carbonate. Now, surprisingly enough, there is another contributor of calcium carbonate to limestones, which not so very long ago was hardly suspected. And they are underwater plants, algae, in fact, underwater algae, that grow rather like shaving brushes on the sea floor. In the Bahamas, the lagoons are covered by these little shaving brush-like algae that stand about six or eight inches high. Um, the lagoon, seen from the air, looks milky white. And that's because of the cal calcium carbonate, or lime mud, which is produced by these algae their skeleton is formed of tiny crystals of calcium carbonate. And when they die, those crystals of calcium carbonate are released to the water, and they accumulate as mud on the lagoon floor. This is some of that mud, now dried out and hardened somewhat. And this is a rock 
formed of lime, mud, such as that accumulating on the floor of the lagoon of the Bahamas today. So the contributors to limestones are nearly all organic, we think, very different organic um, progenitors of limestones, some corals, shells, and so forth, and also these strange algae. And for this reason, we classify limestones as organic sedimentary rocks. Organic limestone, fossiliferous limestone is a name that we give to limestones, which are obviously fossiliferous. They contain very clear and obvious fossils. The other kind of limestone, which illustrates very well the nature of limestone as a precipitate, forms as a result of the consolidation of these particles, which look rather like sand, but in fact are rather like fish eggs in, in cross-section. This is the rock that results from the consolidation of these fragments on the sea floor. They are also quite loose. And in cross-section, you can see how they have a layered structure, rather like the stalagmites and stalactites in a way, but of course on a quite different scale. They're precipitated also, probably by the action of algae, assisted by the action of algae, but probably also because when seawater gets very warm, then calcium carbonate tends to precipitate out of it. Now, sedimentary rocks are not always simply deposited in obvious and simple layers. Just like other rocks, some sedimentary rocks are very oddball. And we'll end this unit on with a look at a very oddball sedimentary rock. The feature we're looking at clearly has all the attributes of a dike. It has sharp, parallel boundaries. It has a vertical, wall-like form. And it cuts markedly across the structure of the whole rock, in this case, the thin sedimentary layers of a sedimentary rock. The question then is, how does sedimentary rock become injected to form a dike through other sedimentary material? The story begins with the deposition of pebbles and sand on the sea floor and the succeeding accumulation of thin layers of calcium carbonate rich mud to perhaps a depth of several tens of feet. The calcium carbonate in this mud acts like cement and hardens the mud so that we end up with a layer, a skin, if you like, of hard material above a sloppy, sandy, pebbly mixture. Imagine then that an earthquake should crack this hard skin above the pebbles and sand. The weight of the overlying material then causes the sloppy mixture to burst up the earthquake-caused crack and to pour out on the surface. And as the sedimentary material, this watery sedimentary material, rises up the crack, apparently the hydrodynamic properties of the flow cause the pebbles to be isolated in the center. And this we've seen on the rock. The erosion and the tilting of the sedimentary beds in the 2,000 million years which have intervened since this feature was formed give us the kind of exposure that we have today.